Knowledge and learning underpin the progress we make as individuals and as a society. When we know more, we can solve new problems and explore fresh possibilities. For hundreds of years, Oxford University Press has been committed to sharing the best in human thinking. From a child reading their very first words to a researcher expanding the frontiers of their field, we passionately believe in the transformative power of knowledge and learning to inspire progress and realize human potential. But the world is changing. When all information is at our fingertips, data needs understanding. As content crowds every screen, ideas need space to breathe. And when the next great thinker can come from anywhere, they need to be seen. So Oxford University Press is changing too. Whether we're making learning work for anyone, anywhere, anytime, connecting a global community of English language learners, or helping influential ideas achieve greatest impact, we will meet the needs of education and research in new ways, with new ideas for new audiences. For as long as the world keeps making progress, we will always be advancing knowledge and learning. Oxford University Press. Advancing knowledge and learning. So part of this commitment is our contribution to spaces like this one, which we highly thank UNED for keeping us in mind and in consideration to participate, to share, and of course, to make connections. Now, today we're gonna to be talking about assessment and testing. And uh, why about this? Why, a te why testing, why assessment? And uh, I believe, or we believe that at some point, us teachers take assessment, take testing for granted. In the, in the sense that uh, we do it in such a mechanical way that we do not fully realize the potential, the impact, and what it means for students, for us teachers, and for our institution, what assessment is, what testing is. There are many strands which we can talk about assessment. We can talk about assessment, full learning, off learning, and we're going to go into that a little bit in more in detail. But today, part of this presentation will be talking about test design because this is what we do every day. We have to assess our students, we have to test them, we have to create our own test. So, if we are creating our own, our own test, shouldn't we be confident enough? to design powerful, efficient, reliable, and valid tests. And uh, this is part of my purpose today. So just to leave you this time, some food for thought around assessment, around our systematic approach to testing, to assessment, to test design, okay? Now, Haraman question is maybe a question that I don't know if we've really got into it before, is why do we test? What's the point of testing? Of course, we have to do it, we do it, but what are the implications of testing? So for that, because when we're talking about assessment, testing is a powerful means of improving learning and not just assessment. I'm not testing, I'm not running tests just because uh, I wanna see how well they, they do or I wanna see how am I teaching, but I need that type of information to inform my teaching. So in that sense, question for you, not to be answered, just for you to keep it in mind. Are those tests that you are applying to your classroom designed in such way that they are providing you with accurate information on not only what your students know, but your teaching, your curriculum, and your path to achieving objectives. Have you given enough thought to those tests that you have designed so that they are so valid that they can indicate where you're going and if you're going on the right track? Not for you to answer me, just to keep that question in mind. Because as I said at the beginning, sometimes we are taking assessment as a mechanical process. 
and maybe we don't go deep into analyzing. Is this test really well designed? Good. So let's get some concepts straight. So first one is that we need to have a clear differentiation between these three concepts. So we have testing on one side, in one side is using tests to examine someone's knowledge. Is when we apply an instrument, is when we apply a oral presentation, a quiz, a final test, uh, I don't know, an essay. So testing is the act of applying the instruments for the sake of for the sake of assessment and for the sake of understanding the student's problems. Assessment, on the other hand, is a systematic process of not only testing, applying tests, but documenting and using empirical data to measure knowledge, skills, attitudes, and beliefs. So we're moving from a more discrete point, which is the use of testing, into a more broader, a more extended concept of testing, which is assessment. And is not only taking into consideration the results of this test that I have applied, but also all the learning interactions that take place either in or outside the classroom in order to document them and make judgments on that. And as it is a process, I'm not only seeing the end of that process or the end of the learning or teaching process, but every single point in which I have contact with some sort of production of my students or with my students. Application of tests, taking the assessment and make judgment, that is evaluation. And this is where tests have more, most of the power because with or according to the information that I've gathered from application of tests and from the assessment process itself, I make a decision, I make a judgment. And those decisions can be in the order of this student passes or doesn't pass. This person is being promoted or not promoted. This person can access to a scholarship or they can't. This person can be can go on an exchange in our country or this person can't. So depending on the level of the impact, depending on how powerful this testing, this assessment, this evaluation information is, we start defining tests as such as high stakes or low stakes. So the more complex and more impactful the, the result is on, in terms of the student, the test taker, we call them a high stage. When there are tests that are, they don't mean to make such a big impact on the students, that's when we call them a low stage. Now, let's talk about assessment. And assessment, we have three types. We say we have assessment for learning. I'm pretty sure that you've heard about it before, so I'm not gonna go deep into this, in which when we talk about assessment for learning, we are talking about a process that is ongoing, is not only at the end of the learning process, but it's all the time, constant assessment. It helps us monitor a student's progress towards the achievement of the goal. And the key is feedback. Taking feedback as the central part of assessment for learning is the criteria for its success. And it's also called alternative or uh, non-traditional assessment because we are not using only tests, but we are using different strategies, portfolios, observations, e-portfolios, uh, mechanical acts, role plays, et cetera. The second category is assessment of learning. So if assessment for learning is monitoring the students throughout the learning process, assessment of learning is making applying instruments to know what the end of the process is. That's why it is of learning. And we call it as is a snapshot of the student's level of, uh, of competence towards 
the goal. It's also considered as a checkpoint through the process. It is under the umbrella of certification and it is discrete in nature. Now, I'm not advocating that assessment for learning is better than assessment of learning. On the contrary, a well-built round and a structured assessment schema for my school, for my institution should contain both and actually should contain this third element as well, which is assessment as learning. And when we talk about assessment as learning, we are referring to metacognitive skills that students use to assess their own learning, what we call self-assessment, but also is peer assessment. It's taking the construct of social cognitive theory and putting them into assessment in which we have peers evaluating each other. Of course, this takes a structuring around the instruments, the training, the type of language, and the moment in which I'm going to use either peer or self-assessment. It promotes metacognition. It involves metacognition, which means thinking about your thinking, thinking about learning, thinking about the process. And if we connect it to the topic that we had yesterday about learning strategies, it's pretty much interconnected in the sense that I have to think how I am learning in order to choose the best strategy. So when it comes to assessment, it means that my student has the inventory or is equipped to analyze the results of those tests or of evaluation and help them improve their own product, their, their own performance. It promotes lifelong learning and it creates a sense of ownership in the sense that this is my information, this is a snapshot of my learning, how am I going to embrace it? And I'm going to use this as a feedback for my own improvement. Good. Now, when we talk about assessment as teachers, we always have to plan, right? I always plan, you plan, we all plan. Now the question is, how do you plan? And uh, in many conversations that I've had for many years with teachers across Latin America and from not only Latin America, the steps are pretty much the same. So I start uh, with my objective, okay? Now my objective is at the end of the lesson or at the end of the period, my students will be able to boom, something with this criteria. After I have my objective, I know where I'm going, I start planning my classes. So I say, oh, okay, so I'm gonna do this activity, I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna use a schema of presentation, practice, and production. I'm gonna present the first the grammar topic, or I'm going to write a big question, or I'm going to start by having a, a contest or a game and then I'm gonna move into the explanation and then I'm gonna do some practice exercise. So those are what we call uh, sequential uh, pedagogy sequences, which is practically our teaching. And then once I have my objective, once I have what I'm going to do, then I go into the assessment part. So I'm gonna use uh, tests, I'm gonna use an essay, I'm going to use a project, I'm going to use a, they have to make a sketch or, or they have to create or put together a, a theater play or they have to do another presentation and they should be connected to my objectives. And that's how traditionally or more commonly are language teachers planning, and not only language teachers, actually pretty, pretty much every teacher plans their uh, assessments. Now, what I want to give leave you today is with a little change. Just make a little change, a little tweak to how you plan your classes and your assessments. And that has to do with something that starts with this concept, backward design. And I'm pretty sure that you've heard about it before, backward design. 
which is the backbone or the cornerstone of something called understanding by design framework. This is a, a concept framework that uh, came about mid 90s, if I'm not mistaken, by some experts that like Dr. J. McTigg and Grant Wiggins, and this is says 2012, 2012, but it was way before that, in which an understanding by design framework says that it has two key ideas, two main ideas, which is number one, focus on teaching and assessing for understanding and learning transfer, which means I do not assess only for me to know what my students know, but also to see how that learning can be transferred into a students and become a base for future learnings. And second is design curriculum backwardly from those ends. It means that we start with the end and then we will we build up from, from that. How is that? So first, we start with the same point. We start with the learning. We start with, start with, the, um, with the goal in mind. So where are we heading? Okay, I'm gonna go back here. Backward, I start with the goal in mind. This is where I'm going. Okay, this is what I'm going to get. This is my, my, my final objective, my learning objective. And when I'm designing and defining what that learning objective should look like, the first traditional but very reliable tool is definitely what we call or what we are known as Bloom's taxonomy. And uh, I remember when I first started teaching many years ago that uh, I, I was putting together my plan, my lesson plan, and uh, this boss of mine came up to me and he had to review it first. So he came up and said, okay, let, let me see what you've done. And he started analyzing it and told me, uh, you know what, there's a problem here. And I say, what, what is the problem? Is that the problem has to do with the verbs and the actions and the thinking skills that you are promoting. And I was like, what is the problem? I think that my, my, my structure is, is very well put together. The planning is well. I'm using the format. I'm using the school format. So what, what is the problem? You say, yeah, but, but you're missing the point of taking your students to different stages of development of different thinking or skills. And that came as a learning that of today, many years before, it still remains with me. And he says, read your plan. So I read it. And uh, he told me, read the actions, because I was taught that when you create a learning objective, you have to think first in an action, in a context, second, an action verb, a behavioral verb, that tells me what is the student gonna be able to do, the performance and then the criteria. And he told me, look at your verbs. And my verbs were very aligned to this number one on the left, knowledge. So we talk about describing or explaining or telling. And my whole lesson plan was on this line, the level, the lowest ordered thinking skill. And he told me, you are not promoting any higher order thinking skills. And then he introduced me more in depth into Bloom's taxonomy and I've been using it ever since. And this is just another message to you. Are we thinking about the objectives that we are setting for our classes? Am I working towards lower order thinking skills or higher order thinking skills? Am I asking my students not only to memorize the knowledge, understand, but also am I asking them to apply, to analyze, to evaluate, or to create? Am I asking them to design something, to role play? Am I asking them to criticize? Am I asking them to defend, to value, 
to plan to grade? Am I asking them to contrast? Am I asking them to conclude? Are these verbs that I'm actually using in my lesson plan? Because according to this first step is how we start implementing the bad word design. My objective, where am I heading to? Which means identify desired results. What are the established goals? What big ideas do we want our students to come to understand? What essential questions will a simulate enter? What knowledge and skills need to be acquired during the objective? So going back, yes, I'm setting up the objective, but what is the quality of that objective? Am I just getting stuck in the first or second level, which are the lower order thinking skills? Or am I taking my students to develop higher order thinking skills that will, in the end, result in learning. So first step is definitely setting your objectives. Let me show you here some examples of sample questions that relate to each one of the levels. For example, you're talking about knowledge, you're talking about recognizing and recalling information. This first three is lower order thinking skills. When you start analysis, you start with higher order thinking skills. So let's go to the analysis one in which I need my students to identify the organization and patterns within a system by identifying its component, its component parts and the relationships among the components. So what questions can we lead my activities for my students to develop this level of thinking skills? Well, for example, what are the parts of when I ask them to classify? when I ask them to outline or when I ask them to diagram. So as you can see, this is crucial to start setting good learning objectives. So that's the step number one. The step number two, determine acceptable evidence. And this is where I suggest you to make this little change, this little tweak. At first, goals, and then the planning. I suggest you to first the goal, but then determine acceptable evidence, which is assessment. Because the testing or the assessment that I apply is going to give me the evidence I need in order for me to make judgments on whether my students have achieved the goal or not. So questions to guide this uh, second stage. What is sufficient and telling evidence of understanding? And let's go back to the behavioral verbs. If you, if you write a learning objective with the word understand, at the end of the class, my students will understand the use of the, what do I know, present perfect. At that point, you have to ask yourself, what is understanding? How can I tell? or how can I evidence understanding? How can I see understanding? Understanding is never a good behavioral verb. We need an action. So if you're thinking about understanding, how does understanding is seen? How is understanding seen? How can you tell that a person has understood? What instruments will be used to assess learning? What criteria will be used to assess the work, rubrics, and what will the assessment reveal and how it would look like? So here, stage two is assessment. Stage two is testing. Stage two has a strong relationship with the goal because what I'm doing is, okay, I know the goal. Now, how am I going to assess if the goal has been achieved? And thirdly, we have the plan, learning, and instruction, which is lesson plan. Now, why is this a powerful change of mind when it comes to planning, not only lesson planning, but also assessment? Well, think about this. With the previous way that I explained to you that most of teachers do, you start creating the assessment according to the learning uh, activities. 
with this schema, with this framework, what you do is, okay, so I want my students to be able to introduce themselves and introduce the partners uh, in a speaking activity. Now you know there is a speaking activity. Go to stage two. If you have defined that that goal is going to be evidenced through speaking or a production, so you know that the assessment is not going to be in writing or in reading. So you now know that your students will be performing an oral presentation or a role play, for example. And then you move into the third stage, which is planning your lesson. And as you know that your students will be performing an oral presentation or a role play in order to evidence the acquisition or the achievement of the goal. So how are your activities going to be? Spoken oriented. So you, can, you know you know that you have to develop your tools, your pedagogical sequences, your resources, your teaching in that area, speaking. So everything is in this on the same line. Everything is aligned and everything makes sense. This is the understanding by, by design framework, which I highly recommend you to try it out. Try it out and see if it works. Maybe you have you come up with a better way, but perhaps this could help you integrate assessment into a more meaningful and powerful way. Now, Let's go back to what we hear today is talking about assessment. What makes a good language test? Now, first of all, a good language test complies with some basic principles in testing and assessment. What are those testing principles? Well, practicality, validity, reliability, authenticity, and watchback. You mentioned it. Let's see each one. So what does practicality mean? It means that it refers to economy of time, effort, and money in testing. Of course, we might want to do speaking tests for a thousand students. Is it something practical? Is it something sensible? Is it easy to administer and design? Is it easy to mark? Are the results easy to or open to interpretation? So this is very important. We might want to have the best test. There is no such thing as a perfect test. No test is, all right? But we need to think that some tests are better suited for our needs, our countries than others. So every time you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to design a test, think, the, think about the practicality of it, how practical the test is. Validity. Validity is understood as, is understood as if the test measures what it intends to measure. Also called, as a, is it fit for purpose? And it includes concepts such as content, criterion, consequential phase, and constant validity. And all these topics, meaning is this test really testing or measuring what it is intending to measure? Am I in the position of creating a test that I teach reading and it actually assess reading or it is assessing writing? Is it assessing sub skills such as scanning or, but I haven't, but my point is for them to do an oral or written production. So the validity is for you to analyze if this test is really aligned with the measuring of the objectives. Reliability. Reliability is if this test provides consistent, replicable information. Of course, we know that uh, we have different students at different levels and they will get different grades at different tests. However, however, a well-designed test when applied to similar populations, the results should be around a mean, okay? So if I know that I have a group of students that are on A2 or A2 plus, and I have different cohorts, and I apply this exam that I get, and one cohort got an average of five out of 10, but the second one got a three out of 10, 
and the third one got a nine out of 10. So there might be a problem with, with either this group are not at the same level or similar level, or, or my instrument is not reliable. Authenticity has to do with the degree of correspondence of the characters by giving language test tasks. Basically, target language, this language the students use. I remember that back in the day, we talked about realia. And every time we talk about authenticity, we talked about realia. And we asked our colleagues that when they, when they went to the States or to UK or Canada, please bring us menus. Please bring us flyers. Please bring us whatever you can find on the street, bring it because that's realia and that's authenticity. That concept has changed over the years. And now we talk about target language, which is the language that our students need and the language that they will, they will use. And watchback, of course, super important concept. And when we talk about watchback, we talk about the impact that a test has on students, on teaching and on learning. Is the influence on teaching and learning. The influence, the influence per se can be either positive or negative. How is that? Think about this. You are teaching at a school, K-12 school, and this school at the end of the year, they have to take a certain exam, right? You know that somehow, according to, or depending on your student's grades, you are going to be evaluated. Your student's performance will be a reflection or your job as a teacher. You know that instinctively we feel like that. So in the same way, instinctively, what I do is that that last year, I'm gonna dedicate my time to teach my students strategies for the test. I'm gonna teach them the format and I'm gonna just flood them with drills and mocks. This is good, though you have missed the point of why you're there. You're there to develop English speaking competencies for these students to go when they go out into the real world and they have to face real conversations. Because once they're going to go to a job, they will most likely not be taking a test. So, in that case, that test that is going to be administered at the end of the year and for the one that you have spent so much preparing for, that is having a negative effect, a negative washback, because you are missing the true point of your being there as a teacher. Now, if you are teaching a course or a program that is specifically oriented into uh, teaching test taking strategies, fine, then it's a positive washback. So the washback depends mainly on the, on the context on the objectives and on if whether it aligns or does not align with the objectives. A test is good if it contains practicality, good validity, high reliability, authenticity, and positive watchback. So if we create a test with these features, we can be pretty certain that we're in the right path to developing a good language test. Step number three, plan for assessment and testing. Well, the first part, uh, the first point was uh, under, uh, understanding by design, backward design. Number two, six principles. Number three, plan for assessment and testing. And what do we do in this case? First, we develop, we create test specification, also called test specs. Test specs are basically the blueprints because we know, we know that you're gonna be using a test and different uh, versions of those tests in the future. So if you have a test specification, you can replicate these same tests in time and it becomes the blueprint. They are written at an item level and you can compare different versions to all versions. You can see how they work with different tests in different populations. When we talk about test uh, specs, we mentioned that there are four, according to Davidson and Lynch, there are four main aspects or components in a test spec, which are 
general description, which is a brief statement of what the focus of the assessment is. What is it for? Prompt attributes, details that will be given to a test taker. You're gonna be given a, a paper, a video, a, something for them to cut out or something to be able to draw. Response attributes. What should happen once they receive those prompts? So they're going to have to write, they have to speak, they have to record themselves, they have to whatever. Sample item, how would the test look like? And the specification supplement, every other information regarding the test. And in the response attribute also includes the evidence, how or what are the criteria that I'm gonna be following for me to define or to decide that a test is actually meeting my description and is meeting my objectives. And I cannot uh, stop talking about one of our, as an Oxford University Press, one of our latest, most innovative tests, which is the Oxford Test of English. We mentioned it yesterday, and I think that this is a good point for you to remind you that the Oxford Test of English is in Costa Rica. It's available for schools, for universities, for students from any segment, for people who are in the corporate sector, if they want to certify their English level with a truly international test that assesses four skills and that is certified and endorsed by the University of Oxford itself, please do not hesitate to reach out to UNED in the Language Center. Uh, any person there could tell you what the Oxford Test of English, it, where it can be taken, the cost, the dates, etc. is very recommended. I want you to skip to the video we read, saw it yesterday, and we say that it's a four, three, two, one test, four skills, three three levels, A2, B1, B2, in only two hours, and results in maximum two weeks in one single multi-level test. Okay. So please check it out, www.oxfordtestofinish.com or go to it and they will give you more information on it. This is a structure or one piece of the Oxford Test of English test specifications. As you can see, it starts explaining the structure, for example, for the writing module, the part, number of tasks, number of items, the structure, and the testing focus. This is what we need to build at a our own context level that shows what the test needs to do. This is also from the Oxford Test of English, but a little more in detail, the criteria. And this has to be, it has to be included on the test specification as well. Because if you're gonna create a different version of the test, then you need to, instead of reinventing the wheel, you have all the info here. If you want to update it, you have to make just a little bit of, a, of adjustment. And if another colleague wants to do it, they just have to go here and create new tests based on a blue blueprint. Good. Four, write the items, build the instrument. This is the getting hand into business part. And remember that we have different type of test items. We have direct test items and indirect test items. What is the main difference? A direct test item, for example, for speaking interviews or essays for writing or are questions that need for my students to do something, to perform something towards the evidence of the goal achieved. So if the achievement, if the goal is, student will be able to write a review, the question is write a review. Indirect on the other hand is uh, measuring the student's knowledge and skills, but what lies beneath their skills. For example, we have multiple choice questions, close items, paraphrasing, sentence learning. We might be measuring or testing for what? Vocabulary, grammar, perhaps. It is not wrong and it is not inappropriate. It's just a complement to a whole assessment framework. Some points for you to remember when you're building up your test, we would like to be, or we like to have, always have productive tests. Right? We want them to speak, we want them to write. I want to evaluate, but let's be honest. When you have 40 students in a classroom and you have 
five groups, meaning that you have 200 students, you will not have the stamina to go through 200 essays, right? I know that you are just nodding yes. I know for a fact. So we need to think about something practical and whether we like it or not, multiple choice question, closed items, paraphrasing and sentence reordering are those items that we can use. It's not bad, but if we're gonna build them and use them, let's use them in combination with more direct items and let's build them well. Some tips that you can find them many uh, literature. For example, when you have multiple choice items, try to state the stem, the main part, as a, as a direct question rather than incomplete statement. So the stem is never incomplete. State a definite explicit and singular question to a problem or in the stem, right? Instead of psychology, ta -ta -ta, is the science of mind and behavior is called, then you have the option amongst psychology. If you are uh, writing a multiple choice question, make sure to eliminate excessive verbiage or irrelevant information. Just make it short and make it simple so the student can know exactly what they have to do. When working or building multiple choice questions, include in the stem any word or words that might otherwise be repeated in each alternative or answers in distractors. So for example, look at the first one. We have in national election, blah, 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 chosen by the people, chosen by the members, chosen by the house, chosen by the electoral college. Instead of having chosen, 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 just go and put chosen in the stem and you will solve your problem there. Avoid use negatively items. And if you have to use them, please underline it, make it capitalize it or bring it back, emphasize it. That's very, very important as well. Make all alternatives plausible. Make sure that the answers are grammatically parallel, no one longer than the other, no one in present or in past tense, no? Make them all make sense. Uh, present alternatives in logical order, chronologically, most to least, or alphabetical, for example. Make alternatives approximately equal in length. Don't give some options short and or longer. Make them the same way and avoid relevant clues such as grammatical structure, well-known verbal association or connections. So these are some pointers for you to bear in mind when building multiple choice questions. And finally, feedback. And effective feedback means that it's educative in nature, is given in timely manner. So it, it, when, you, when I talk about educational, I mean that it is just to help my students, not for my own sake is given when it is needed, is sensitive to the student's needs, and it answers four questions. What can the student do? What can the student do? How does the student's work compare with that of others? And how can the student, how can the student do better? So we put this together, we can be certain that we'll be providing effective feedback. Yes? And always, always, always provide a model or example. Don't tell them this is wrong, or this, is, or this is not correct unless you use all this, plus this is how it should have been done. And uh, I'm gonna send you this on the presentation. I'm very conscious of time and I just want to go into summarizing. So for summarizing, when you are building a good language test, please implement backward design. Second, make sure that your test uh, complies with principles in testing and assessment. Plan for the assessment and the testing. Write the items. When actually plan is test specifications. Build the instrument, take into consideration different guidance to write multiple choice questions, true, false, or close questions appropriately. And design, find, uh, design feedback that is appropriate and is effective. Okay, one minute over the hour. My apologies, but thank you so much. As always, a pleasure to be here with you. And if you have any questions, please do let me know or just drop me an email that I'd be more than glad to help you or answer whatever question you have regarding assessment, OUP, or the Oxford Test of English. Thank you so very much. Yeah.